This study is going to be topical for our study through Revelation, the time is near. Uh, topical because I'm talking about a topic, I'm not going verse by verse, uh, but we are going to look at plenty of scripture today. And the topic is one of a controversial nature between both seasoned believers, new believers, and even unbelievers. Uh, I'm not going to go into intense detail in this message, but what I'm going to try and do, at least I hope, I pray, is show you what I believe is the heart of God based on Scripture. Not just on what I feel, not just on how I feel towards God or my own experience, but just what the Scripture shows in some places. And the topic is the rapture in the case of the tribulation. The great tribulation. We all go through trials and troubles, but there's a time coming upon our earth that will be, if you can believe it, far worse than even 2020 is and was when this year is over. We can't wait for that. But there are arguments for many different views on what the Bible says, even amongst believers and denominations and sects, and even against those who would hate the Bible and come against the Bible. But just because there are different arguments doesn't mean those arguments are true. Just because you can doctrinally add something up doesn't necessarily mean it matches God's outcome or God's will or God's desire for what the Bible says. We need to take the Bible in context. We need to let the Bible teach the Bible. And more than that, because many people have let the Bible just teach them the Bible, but let the Holy Spirit teach us what the Bible says. Now, many people will be afraid of that saying because they can't control the Spirit. They can't understand the ways of the Spirit, just like Jesus said. But you know what? Who better to teach us what the Bible says than God himself? And unfortunately, this topic that we're looking at this morning tends to separate believers. They fall into one of three or sometimes more camps, usually one of two camps, depending if where you fall on different lines of denominations. And it tends to separate us. Say we, We're not even in a fellowship. We won't even talk. We get angry and fight over these things. But why? They're not matters of salvation. I believe it's simply a matter of timing. Because all believers in Jesus who believe in his atonement at the cross, his forgiveness for our sin, his resurrection from the dead, and in fact, he is God's one and only son, he is God incarnate, are going to be saved. The Bible is clear about that. It's not believe in Jesus and make sure you have every other doctrine right, because that's impossible. So why do we get separated on these things? I understand that it can affect the way ministry is carried out, the way your life is carried out, the way what you're expecting and what you're looking for, but man... We don't need to be totally separated because, again, we're talking about timing. We're talking about order of operations. You know, uh, as part of my job, I program. And in ver some, some programs, it matters very much what order you do things in, and some programs, it doesn't. And I don't want to put too much emphasis on the order of things because the Bible gives different pictures of the same time period throughout history through different writers and different things, and they're all clear, I believe, but sometimes it's hard to pin down exactly what is what and what day this happens and what day that happens. And we have a, a better idea. Well, they both happen next week, but we're not sure uh, what we're doing on Tuesday just yet. And that won't be clear until we get closer to the day. I think we can all relate even to our own plans. We have plans for the week, but then things get shuffled around. And I'm not saying God shuffles things. But what I'm saying is we're trying to peer into the future through the lens of prophecy from a perspective of heaven, when we're stuck here, wherever you're stuck listening to me right now, in your car, at home, in this room, and we need to get God's vision on this. And God is not a cold and distant God. He is a loving, He's Emmanuel, God with us. He's cold to us. So I think we both need to understand the doctrine, but we also need to understand His heart. And in fact, I have a very close friend who believes differently than I in this. I'll be candid with you. I'm pre-trib and he's post-trib. I like to say to them, he can be wrong all, anytime he wants. And I'm going to take, take the early bus. He can take the late bus. And if I take the early bus and he's still around, he can, he can help himself to my stuff. And we joke about it because it's so hard to find someone who 
you can fellowship with who doesn't believe exactly the same way as you. Like I said, we get into arguments. It's like, why? Have either of us been there? Are either of us experts on God or the scripture? No. But we both hold to our, 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 uh, our beliefs and are willing to try and argue in the sense of debate, a healthy debate with each other. Because again, the scripture, you know, if he, he has his points and I have mine, I think the scripture can kind of show you both sides, but I believe only one uh, in the sense is true. I believe in fact, that there's a lot more going on here as we'll look at it a little bit. But again, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds in this message. I want to get to some key points here that I hope will help you make, your, make up your mind and most importantly, again, what's the fruit of the doctrine that we teach and we believe? Is it just that we can be right on something? Just that we can know something? God, I, I pray not. I hope not. It should be bringing people to God. It should be bringing them to the love and forgiveness and grace and mercy and a relationship with Jesus now before it's too late. Because I do believe in Jesus' letters, as we've looked at so far in our study in Revelation, to the church show that some of the church will be leaving, taking that early bus. Some of it will be staying through the tribulation. And far worse, some of it even going to the final judgment itself without Jesus as their mediator. Now this time period of the great tribulation will be a period of faith, will bring about a new group. I don't, I don't want to say class because it puts like a hierarchy in it, but a new group of saints called the tribulation saints who will come to faith during this time and they do not take the mark of the beast. Again, I'm not going to open that can of worms right now. And I believe that they, most of them will ultimately pay the price for their faith with death except the few that make it to the very end. And they're going to have to because there's not going to be easy. You look how it is right now in the persecution of Christian across the world. Even if you're not a Christian, you just don't go, don't go along with a party line, how quickly you're ostracized, your business is kicked out. Give it a couple more years, people. But again, we're talking about future events, things prophesied about. And we, we get scared of prophecy, but don't be scared of it. Embrace it. It, is, it. it gets me so psyched, so excited because, man, we have a window into things that are going to happen that the world wishes it has. Again, things can shift and change from our perspective based on our understanding of the world, based on our understanding of world powers and alliances. And again, even we have no idea what's really going on. You think that we're privy to the things that billionaires and world powers are privy to behind closed doors and secret meetings, public and not? No way. We are treated like cattle. But these things don't change from God's perspective. He is above it all. In fact, the Bible says he sits and laughs at the nations as they rage and plan. So for you and me or anyone else to claim we know with absolute certainty the very specific details and times and moments, I don't believe is possible. The scripture says so. However, I believe the scripture does show us that we can claim with absolute certainty the conditions and the times and seasons for which these places will take place and what these world powers and world leaders and events and scenarios will look like. We may just not know whether the mark of the beast is made by Apple or made by Google or Elon Musk or somebody else. I don't know. But with that said, Father, we want to talk to you. We want to hear from you. Not my opinion, not the things necessarily that you've even shown me, but what does your word say? And God, I pray that everyone listening would hear you speaking to them, Holy Spirit. They would be convicted and drawn close to you. And even though if they're buried in sin, that they would know that they can be forgiven and washed clean, whiter than snow by your blood. And it's taken far away, the east from the west. Let this message to old believers, new believers, and unbelievers alike be an encouragement to follow you and trust you and be ready for your coming, whatever nanosecond that may be. But God, we do pray that that would even be now. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. So a little definition here, rapture. People go, rapture is not in the Bible. Yes, it's not in the Bible because the Bible is written in Hebrew and Greek. And rapture, rapturos, is a Latin word. My high school Latin teacher would be proud of me for knowing that. But it comes from the Greek harpazo, which means the snatching up. Almost as if, I think I've said it before, if my kids are running out in the street and a bus was coming down the road or anything was coming down the road, I would snatch them out of the road. Harpazo. 
We think of rapture being also in the thought of caught up in love. They were enraptured in love. And this is what's described in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. If you want to turn there. It says, Paul says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. He's speaking to the Thess- believers in Thessalonians, or Thessalonica. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, he means who have died, believers who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. There's so much we can unpack from here, but I'm going to breeze by it. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means go before those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, raptured, harpazo, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So, this is where we get an idea of harpazo, the word rapture. Uh, my friend uses it in his arguments uh, against uh, my position. And I think that that's fair in some degree. But, let's take a look at a couple other terms and take that in, uh, into a different context, a larger context, I believe. The Bible talks about a period coming called the Great Tribulation, a time of great trial, a time of great uh, pain and judgment on the earth. Not just hurricanes, not just storms, not just diseases, not just wars and famines, but worse than the world has ever seen. The world's only been around 6,000 years, so let me give you another little controversy right there. But even if it was around for a billion years, it would be worse than all those years put together. It's the final seven years of trouble on the earth that is meant to judge the nations. Nations don't go into the afterlife. We do, but the nations don't. And the nations have a lot of judgment coming against them. In fact, God will use other nations, even unbelieving nations, to judge each other. Even if you look at Israel in the past, God used Babylon and others to judge his own people and bring them off into captivity, something that, because they were disobedient, he brought unbelievers in to, to, to do that to them. But during this final time, Uh, of tribulation on the earth, God will pour out his wrath on the earth. And like we looked at before, it's not just to judge because the final judgment is coming when he sits on the judgment throne and people are judged based on what they've done. And obviously anything done without Jesus is wicked and they're cast into hell forever by their choice, remember, not his. But it's also to give people a last chance before hell because as bad as the tribulation is going to be, it ain't as bad as hell, guys. Seven years in tribulation is far better than seven seconds in hell. And during this time, Satan will be in full control of the earth. You might think he's in full control now, but he is not. The Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit through the church in the church age we live in are in his way. Why do you think he raises against the church, gets Christians to fall, cuts the church apart, wants God out of schools, wants God out of TV, can't talk about the Bible because it's in his way of doing what he wants to do with one world government and him on the throne and people allied to him against God in all sorts of slavery to wickedness. You think the slavery of America was bad? Well, I tell you, slavery to sin is infinitely worse. And that was related to that too. But eventually Satan will possess a man who is the final Antichrist. I believe there's been other types of Antichrist. In fact, the Bible even says the spirit of the Antichrist has been here since the time of Jesus. And he's going to have a false resurrection, which we're not going to go into for time. Uh, much like Satan sought for Moses' body, but he couldn't find it. He'll have this man to do it. And people will pledge their allegiance to him and take his mark and condemn themselves forever. I could go on and on. It's exciting and I love it, but I'm not going to for time. I want to get through this with you guys. So if that's the tribulation period. What is pre, mid, and post-trib? Well, pre-trib basically believes that God is going to take the believing church. Notice my adjective there, the believing church, not just those who call themselves a church, taken to heaven. And along with those who have already died, like we saw in Thessalonians, to heaven to skip over the tribulation since we are what? not appointed to wrath. And why do I say that? Because 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 10 says, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Now you can believe whatever you want to believe. 
I can't force you to believe the way I believe, but I just want to share this with you because I believe it'll bring some sort of freedom in your life and some sort of encouragement to look up, as we'll see. But either immediately in the aftermath, the AC, the Antichrist, will be revealed and will promise peace. He'll strike up an accord with Israel and other nations because they began to attack Israel. And I believe America is going to be out of the picture. Uh, at least if it happens in the next 10, 20 years, America will be out of the picture. We won't be there to defend Israel, so Israel won't have any nations to defend it. All of Middle East and, and uh, uh, Russia and Iran will come in, and China will come in and try and get them. And the Antichrist is going to broker a peace. You know, we think of the Antichrist as this, going to be this one world unity government, and it's going to be utopia. Well, kind of, but not really. There's going to be a lot of warring factions because, you know, the world, they're not going to want one guy to take over. Another, you know, it's not going to work. It's going to be, I, it, Satan's kingdom isn't as organized as we think it to be. They're always infighting among us. And so the church should be totally different than that. Should it not? But he's going to make this peace accord that's supposed to last seven years. And that's the marker of the beginning of the tribulation and the seven years is the end. And halfway through, three and a half years, the Bible teaches us, he's going to break that. He's going to stand in the Holy of Holies, the abomination of desolation, and can tell everyone, hey, look, guys, I'm not playing around anymore. I'm God. Come worship me. That's it. This is over. We're not going to have peace any other way unless you come to me and bow to me. And someone's going to try and kill him. There's going to be a false, you know, that's where all this other interesting stuff happens. But mid-trib believes that the church is going to go out then. And post-trib believes that the church is going to go out and be dealt with at the end. Um, and I think mid-trib has the least argument of them all. Then there's others who believe that all this has already happened already, uh, generally more uh, in Catholicism. But I think that's totally crazy. Uh, no offense. But however, let's look at uh, Matthew 24, um, 36 through 44. And I'm going to turn there. Matthew 24, 36 through 44. It says, this is Jesus. He says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even of the angels in heaven, but my father only. So Jesus doesn't even know. He's waiting for his dad to tell him. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of some man be. For as in the days uh, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Let me repeat that. Watch therefore, Jesus says, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. And he goes on, he says, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the son of man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Jesus talks about the days of Noah. People were out partying, living their life, starting businesses, getting married, drinking, doing all that stuff. And all of a sudden, bloop, 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 raindrops start falling on their head. Noah's in his boat. It's too late for them. And they get wiped out and drowned. And Jesus says it's going to be the exact same way. And he's not talking about Noah in the boat. He's talking about the times of the world, the attitude of the world. And what is the world doing today? Like Peter says, they're scoffing. Jesus ain't coming back. Jesus ain't even real. There's multiple universes. You can do whatever you want. There's no God. In fact, you are God. Let's just go and drink and, and do all the crazy things we do and get rid of the church because we're sick of you ruining our party. The end is not coming. We are the future. Whoa. That sounds a lot like the days of Noah. Not only do they not expect it to come, they say it will never come. And yet... They run around like we run around like our chickens with their heads cut off in 2020 because we can't go to the gym or to a restaurant. And that's a whole nother topic. But we see here what Jesus says that we will not know the exact day or hour. And I love this because so many books have come back out in the past half century claiming to know the exact day and hour of Jesus is coming out. I'm like, did nobody even read this? Did the person who was writing the book even read Matthew once? Because Jesus says, clearly, there's no way to know. And if we don't know that exact day or hour, and yet the Bible is clear about the seven years when we look at Daniel, Ezekiel, and other places, we would, also, we would be able to set a countdown clock based on that peace deal with Israel. We would say, oh, they just signed today at noon. 
So seven years from now, we've got her. Three and a half years from now, on noon, Jesus is coming back. It doesn't work that way. Now, maybe you have another argument for that, and I'd be happy to hear you and talk with you about it. But that's the other problem. Is if we're not pre-trib, which I believe the Bible gives strong evidence for, and the Spirit and the heart of God, at least to me, seem to point that way. If we're not pre-tribbed and looking to heaven for our Savior, our Master come, getting ready, preparing ourselves, looking up to heaven, where are we looking? We're looking on the earth. We're looking, is that the Antichrist? Could he be it? Is that the space in the UN? Is that the accord with the EU? Is that the peace deal with Donald Trump in the Middle East? Is that it? And what is it? We are distracted and we are going to miss his coming and not be ready for it. Now, I'm not saying everyone who believes that is totally distracted and going to miss it. What I'm saying is we start to do that and our eyes start to go elsewhere. And before you know it, our eyes are nowhere near any of this stuff and we're caught up with the world. Because it's going to be a surprise. We're to watch like the 10 virgins in Matthew 25. Read it for yourself. Some were ready, some weren't. And the ones who weren't were cast into outer darkness because they didn't have the, the oil, the Holy Spirit. They weren't ready. They knew it was coming. They said, oh, we'll just stop at the gas station on the way there. You know how that goes when you're planning to get gas the next morning before going to work and then you oversleep and then there's a line at the gas station then you're late for work. Should have just gotten it the night before. But Jesus also says one person left and another taken. And you can look at this a couple different ways. But I think it's also interesting to say that, hey, some people are going, some people aren't. And it could very well be the rapture is you're hanging out with your unbelieving friend and you disappear before their eyes. And then all these theories about aliens and the earth cleansing itself and all sorts of crazy things, I'm sure, even crazier than we'd imagine, come out. But I think, you know, as we see this, we see that the Bible says that we need to be ready. Jesus says that that could happen at any moment and it still could. And just because it hasn't taken the past 2,000 years for it to happen, doesn't mean that it couldn't have happened in the first century. It doesn't mean that the believers then were wrong. It just means that in one way, God is gracious and merciful and didn't let it happen that people after people after people would be given an opportunity. But I also think based on other scripture that the church was being effective and somehow staying by the Holy Spirit the execution on the earth, the wrath of God coming, holding back the Antichrist for appearing because God was using the church. God was filling his believers. But we're in a day and age when even the church doesn't want God in it. And the church is lukewarm, Laodicea like we read. And the world's growing darker and darker and more rotten exponentially, guys. I think the next five years are going to be worse than the last 50 years. And I pray I'm wrong. Pray I'm wrong. But Israel was fulfilled as a nation in one day after World War II, fulfilling prophecy. Plus all the political alliances of Russia and China and Iran right now. Technological advancements in brain chips and implants and credit cards and Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, a total domination of supervision of everything you want to do. And we sign up for it. We sign up for it and pay too much money for cell service and cell phone to be tracked. Give it a couple more years, guys. It's totally inevitable at this point. All these things are being outlined. And I'd wager, again, I don't know the day or the hour, but I'd be surprised if we make it another decade. At the time around, I was coming, to get, coming back to the Lord and God was saving me and, and showing me I was reading Revelation. And I just got the sense, twenty, you know, based on other things and some sat, uh, asteroids and things coming, 2030 to be late. I'm not going to stand by that, but that was my gut. And that was 17 years ago. And again, it could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be 100 years from now, I don't know. But the way things are going, the way things are lining up, if you were a betting man and I'm not, I think this is what you want to put all your money on. In fact, I'm putting my entire life on it. I'm putting my family's life on it. I put my career, I put my everything on it. Because though I know it's coming, I believe it's coming, I better act like it's coming. But again, we can't know the hour, but we can know the season. Much like it's the days of Noah today, things going on. Isn't the world afraid of another flood right now? They're afraid of what? Global warming. But what's the end of global warming? The ice caps melting and their beach houses flooding, right? They are afraid of another flood. And that's partly why I don't buy into global warming in the complete hysteria that it is. I'm not saying that we can't have any impact. I'm saying the hysteria that it is is being used 
for so many nefarious reasons. It's totally the spirit of the Antichrist. And I know if you're listening, you're gonna, if you believe in this stuff, it's going to shock you. But that's why I don't totally believe it. Because God said the next judgment is not going to be a worldwide flood. It's going to be worldwide fire. And there's not going to be an escape in any boat from that. First Thessalonians 5, 1 through 5. Again, too much to unpack. I'm sorry for even touching on it a little bit because it's, it's a lot for uh, 10 other messages. But First Thessalonians 5, 1 through 5 says, But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Paul says, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord that comes in the thief of night. The Thessalonians knew this. They got this. They understood this. For when the world says, Peace, safety, everything is going to be okay, we promise. Then sudden destruction comes upon them. And haven't we seen that? As labor pains upon a pregnant woman, they start out a little bit and more and more and more and more and more and more and more. And we see that 2020 is full of labor pains and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So even though Jesus said he's coming as a thief, he tells us to watch. And because of that, Paul says, we can figure it out and we are not going to be surprised when Jesus comes back. It might, you know, startle you when you hear that trumpet go, right? But you're going to go, oh, yeah, it totally makes sense. I'm totally ready because you're ready and watching and waiting. But if you're not, and you claim to be a Christian and claim to be in the, sun, in the light, why would it take you by surprise? If you're excited to go somewhere, you're watching the clock, you're waiting for your Uber to show up, you know what time your flight is leaving. If you're excited to go to heaven, guys, we should have every idea what the times and season are when our Lord and Master and Savior and lover and friend is coming back. And if you don't, I have to wonder, where's your affection? And I'm not perfect in this. You know, it's like God always has to uh, rekindle my flame and draw me back to Him. But you know what? He does. And the reason why it's so hard for me to, to go too far away is because I know that all this is coming. Like Peter said, God, where else are we going to go? There's no place else to go. The world is <laughs> the world's on fire. In a sense, I've got no choice but to love Jesus and, and amen for that. And I pray for those who are in places where their choices are much harder than mine here in this country. But since Jesus brought Noah up in his time, let's go back to Noah. And let's even go back to right before Noah in the genealogy and look at some of Noah's grandparents. And Genesis 5, 18 through 24 says, Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. And after he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. And Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. And after he begot Methuselah, Enoch, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. So he only lived 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. And all that, you could get debate about the ages and all that stuff. But the key verse I want to look at is 24. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. This whole genealogy up to Noah doesn't say that about anybody else. It says it about this guy who is a couple, uh, couple steps back from Noah on the rungs. And he goes home to be with God. God took him home. Enoch didn't die. God, I believe, raptured him. So right before God brings judgment on the world, there's this man, Enoch, who's walking with God, whose life is with God, where he steps with God, he prays to God, he follows God, he lives righteously. And even his name means dedicated. And right before the judgment, the flood, God takes him. He's walking with God and taken not because he's a good man, but because he's staying close to God. And does that not sound like a picture of the church walking and dedicated to God and then taken? Well, what about Noah himself? Well, it says in Genesis 6, It came to pass when man began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born of them, the sons of God. And we'll skip down. Um, and God says, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Uh, he's got 120 years left. Um, there were giants and all these uh, other amazing things going on. And then the Lord, verse 5, saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Does that not sound like today? And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. It doesn't say God was angry and outraged and triggered. It says that he was grieved. Oh, I made man and all they are is wicked. Oh, 
I have to get rid of them. I have to get rid of this plague of sin. And so God said he's going to destroy all them and everything he created. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And um, Noah was a just and perfect man. And Noah walked with God. And so God spoke to Noah. The end of all flesh has come before me. And told him to build a boat. I don't think anyone else, because their heart was so wicked, would have even heard God if he was shouting at them. In fact, I know that because he was shouting at them through Noah building the ark. And what did they do? They made fun of Noah for being ready for the Lord's coming. Because when the Lord was coming, he was bringing judgment. And God saves him through the judgment. Sort of like a post-trib argument here. However... I believe it's a little different because God hadn't brought his salvation plan of the Messiah to fruition yet. And he wanted to keep mankind going by at least one man and one family who are worth saving. Enoch was gone already. And again, imagine if Noah didn't listen, uh, but you know, God would. God knew he would. But God's plan wasn't done yet. And in the end, even with everything going on, God still has more plans for the earth and for new heavens and new earth, and for people who follow him after this. Just because it's the end of the nations, and the end of the world as we know it, doesn't mean that it's the end of eternity. In fact, that's the beginning of eternity. And I don't think that the church who's been saved has any need to go through it. Like Romans 5, 9 says, much more than having now been justified by God's blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And I know you can take that to mean we'll be saved through the period of wrath through him that he'll protect people and he will, but I don't believe that that's his heart. If I'm about to get married, why am I going to drag my wife through the mud? Why am I going to put her through a battle? I'm going to want to set her aside, let her go get dressed and get her makeup on and do her thing. And that's what our time here is for. So again, if the tribulation is God's wrath poured out on the earth, why should we who have been judged already at the cross, where God's wrath was poured out on Jesus for all those who would accept it, in a sense, even for those who didn't, why would we get double jeopardy? Why would we be tried for the crimes of the nations? The answer is, I believe, we won't. Not to mention, just like Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah, when God came down, he heard the cries of wickedness of the city. He came down with the two angels. He spoke to Abraham, given the promise of Messiah, but then he went down to Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham tried to convince God to save the city for ten righteous, and there weren't even ten. But God saw the wickedness for himself, and what did he do? He got Lot out. He sent his angels to pull Lot out of that city before judgment came on it. So he did that for Lot, who shouldn't have been there in the first place. Why would he not do that for us? And Jesus has visited the earth already. He's already come down and seen the wickedness of man and died for it. Why would those who believe in him? And you can give me an argument back, and I will certainly listen to it and take it into consideration, but I just it doesn't add up to me spiritually. And again, shameless plug for my study through Genesis, God and man. Stream it free on the website or on the New Wine podcast because I believe when we went through that, I was really blessed to see it was really God and man, not just these stories, but really God working in the lives of Jacob and Joseph and Abraham and, and all these people. Now back to the letters from the churches from Jesus, and we're going to be uh, closing up soon here. It's clear that they have to hang on. It's clear that they need to repent or they will face judgment. And that's Jesus saying to them. That's not John. John's just like, I'm just writing down what God's saying. So I believe that Christians who have been faithful have not been corrupted or are actually following Jesus and not just Christians or churchgoers in name only will be raptured. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. We are sealed there's no way you and I would take the mark. There's no way you'd call out the Antichrist for who he is the minute he sh- you wouldn't call him out the minute he showed up. You've got the Holy Spirit in you. 
There's no choice there. You would never do it. Second, and we're going to read 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12 here as we get ready to uh, wrap this up. 2 Thessalonians 2 says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had already come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And we see that in the church. The world is falling away from Him, even His church. Two, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. Uh, and who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself, not really, but showing himself, he's proving to himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told these things? And now I know that what is restraining, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains, as the Holy Spirit, will do so until he... Um, I'm sorry, I lost my place. So he is taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit's restraining, verse 7, until the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way. Well, if he's in us, and he's the one restraining, and he's our guarantee, why would he leave us and forsake us on the earth when the Bible is clear that God will never leave us nor forsake us? For the mystery of, uh, sorry, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So Jesus is coming again at the end of this tribulation. The coming of the lawless one is according with the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might, not, might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they may all be condemned who do not believe the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. And when we reject the truth, there's only one thing left for us, deception. If we don't love the truth, especially in these deceptive days when even the news and public figures lie to you straight to your face, if we don't love the truth, we're going to quickly fall for the lie. So the Holy Spirit is the one restraining the enemy from being revealed, holding back the floodgates of evil. And as evil as things are now, they are restrained, guys. The world kicks and moans and screams to get God out of everything. But just wait until they truly get what they want. I, I, I'm fearful to see what America gets in the next four years when we get what we want, what we kicked and screamed and cheated and lied for. So brethren... Brothers and sisters, unbelievers and believers alike, you can take whatever bus you want. But I'm telling you, the early bus is the only one that's coming and you want to be on it. You can get out later, but you might be too deceived to. You can't guarantee what's going to happen tomorrow. You can't guarantee that you're not going to give yourself over to the mark. If you reject him now in an age of grace, who's to say you're going to reject him, you're going to accept him tomorrow? Today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Don't delay. You know what? I don't want to go through wrath. That's what got me to repent 17 years ago. was reading Revelation and God showing me that this was coming and that I wasn't ready. And you know what? God can save us through trials and tribulations. He will save through the great tribulation those who turn to him during it. There will be, especially among the Jewish people, which I think is awesome. But what logical reason, what loving reason would he have for us to go through that great tribulation, which is meant for the nations that rage against him? What reason would he put his bride through that? I haven't been convinced of any. I want to protect my bride. I want to cover her. I want to protect my children. I also want them to live for the Lord. But I'm not going to purposely put them through something. We got married for a reason. That's the same thing with the Lord. And even after this great tribulation, God's salvation plan isn't over. Even in it, angels will proclaim the gospel while flying through the sky, the scripture says, is no longer up to the church at this point because the church is going to be so repressed, so underground. People will come to him and it will work, but it's not going to be the same. 
It's not going to be the Holy Spirit revival going on. It's going to be people afraid of judgment and realizing that they were wrong and that they still have a chance to repent. But you know what? Most, 99% of people still won't believe. They'd rather the rocks fall on them. Even though they know it's God coming back, they know it's Jesus, they'd rather raise their fist and die. So people still won't believe. So don't fault yourself when they don't believe you now, Christian. Because it's really the Holy Spirit they're resisting. They may hate you, they may hate me, but it's really God they hate. You and I are just the vessel that's been sealed by Him. Much better than that Tupperware <laughs> burp from the 80s. Now again, there are many more places to look in Scripture. Many more hours of debate can be done on this. But I think this is a good primer. A good thought starter for you to rationally consider the Scriptures. To lovingly think about what our Heavenly Father is truly saying to us and truly sees for us and has for us and what He feels for us. God feels for you and me. He loves you and me. He sings over us, the Bible says. That's not a cold God. That's not a distant God. That's a loving father. A loving husband. A caring shepherd. And one more thing. Two more things. Even countries that are wicked get their citizens out of a foreign land before they go to war. Before they attack even before it's officially called, like China was calling people out, other nations were. So why would God be any less just to call and even take out our Pazzo, the people he loves, before all-out open war is declared? Especially when he loved and died for us. So with that, if you never received Jesus, if or if you have, wherever you are with the Lord when you're listening to this, if you know that you are not with Him, you are not safe, you are burdened, you are fighting a deep darkness, you are a slave to sin, maybe once you knew the goodness of God, but you've turned. Maybe you've rejected Him your whole life, but you're now seeing, man, I have no other way. It's good to be at the end of yourself. God doesn't want you to clean up and come to Him. God will clean you up. He did it for me. He's done it for millions of others. Accept Him. Accept that He loves you. That He died for you. That the sins you commit and are slave to, He took upon Himself. But know that He didn't stay in the grave. The cross is empty. The grave is empty. But heaven is full. That God is alive. And He's ministering to you. He wants to live inside you. So if that's you as you're listening, please pray this prayer. It doesn't have to be these exact words. But try and follow with me. And mean it from your heart. The Bible says if you can believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved from all of this wrath to come. Lord Jesus, forgive me. I've done so much wrong. I've tried to stop or I can't stop. Help me, God. Wash me. Give me a new life, your life. Help me read the Bible and trust you. Take me to heaven. and I believe that you're God and that you died for me and that you rose again. Thank you, God, that you say that if I pray that, I'm okay with you. I don't have to do anything else. I get to follow you now and leave the world and my old self behind. I'm a new creation in Jesus. Thank you, God. And Lord, for any of those who prayed, whether they followed you or not, let them know that they're forgiven. They're cleansed. It's behind them. They are new. It is gone as far as the east is from the west. And you will not hold it over them anymore. The enemy might try and bring it back up, but let them hold strong in you. Guard them, I pray, even with your angels. But God, come soon and let us all be ready for you on that day and not take us by surprise. But when we hear that trumpet, we'll shout back <laughs> amazing praise to you and meet you in the air. Uh, but God, if for some reason I'm wrong and we do need to go through tribulation, we trust that you'll get us through. But Lord, we, whatever the case may be, Lord, I, I just can't wait to be with you in, uh, in heaven and see you face to face. Thank you for saving me. 
And please cover my family and friends and all those who hear. In Jesus' name, amen. So may God bless you and keep you and his face shine upon you. There is a vineyard of the Lord. There is a vineyard for our soul. With all our troubles left behind the door, we drink first light until.